A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about their influences from the worlds of literature, film, music and of course art and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With, Adam Pendleton, who makes paintings, drawings, performances, films and other works exploring the relationship between blackness, abstraction and histories of the avant-garde. He's perhaps best known for an ongoing body of work he calls Black Dada, for which he's produced an explanation text and a reader. The concept fuses the theories of the modernist avant-garde, like the Dada movement, with moments of black literature, resistance and activism, like the poetry of Amiri Baraka, from which he took the name. Adam has described Black Dada as a framing device for his artistic inquiry, a way of talking about the future while talking about the past and about looking at blackness as an open-ended idea that's not just related to notions of race. Adam was born in 1984 in Richmond in Virginia, the city which, until last year, had an infamous equestrian statue of the Confederate General Robert Lee, the subject of one of Adam's recent video pieces. Adam now lives in Brooklyn. He was a precocious young artist. He studied at the Art Space Independent Study Programme in Pietra Santa, Italy, between the ages of 16 and 18, and was showing paintings in galleries in New York aged just 20. Those early canvases set him on a path he continues to walk to day, sampling excerpts from text which were silkscreened on canvas. The written word remains a crucial tool, even if his palette, bright monochrome colour in the early pieces, has changed to predominantly black and white today. Towards the end of the 2000s, Adam had a couple of landmark career moments. At the 2007 Performer Biennial, he created The Revival, a hugely compelling performance in which he recited a secular sermon, with excerpts from poetry and political speeches, accompanied by a large gospel choir and musicians, including the pianist and artist Jason Moran. The following year, Adam presented his Black Dada Manifesto as a performance in Rovereto, Italy, as part of the European Biennial Manifesto 7. The Black Dada paintings, an ongoing series, are mostly all black canvases which feature letters from the eponymous phrase accompanying close-up details of a sculptural work by the minimalist Sol the Wit called Incomplete Open Cubes. As the painting's title suggests, they're the most literal manifestation of the Black Dada concept, but they relate closely to numerous other groups of paintings which each have distinctive imagery and textual content. Series like Systems of Display and Our Ideas use photographs, including those of artefacts or art collections, found in Pendleton's extensive image library, before being photocopied and silkscreened onto mylar, canvas or small mirrors in the case of Systems of Display. The series Untitled, The Victim of American Democracy, fuses loose vertical lines with often blurry cut-up language from a 1964 speech by Malcolm X. Another, called Untitled Masks, features bold images of Liberian Dan masks, which vary from work to work in their legibility and often include vigorous spray-painted passages. Adam's process is idiosyncratic. Rather than exhibiting the works in their original form, he takes photographs of them, manipulates them in Photoshop and then silkscreens them onto canvas. So however expressive or violent his marks may appear, they're always somewhat mediated. He frequently brings multiple groups of paintings together in installations alongside pieces in other media, including his videos. Among his many moving image works is a series of video portraits of leading choreographers, including Ishmael Houston-Jones, Carl Abraham and Yvonne Rayner. Perhaps his most important exhibition displaying these diverse strands of his practice was Who is Queen at the Museum of Modern Art in New York between September 2021 and February 2022. On a purpose-built wooden scaffold stretching to the heights of MoMA's atrium, he showed several painting series alongside drawings, a textile piece and videos including a portrait of the trans writer Jack Halberstam, a film exploring Resurrection City, an ad hoc encampment set up on the National Mall in Washington DC during the Civil Rights 
rights protests of 1968 and his film of that Robert Lee monument in Richmond, Virginia. These different bodies of work add up to a complex network of thoughts and ideas, veering from matter-of-fact clarity to abstraction. Adam's spoken of his work in terms of a balance between invitation and refusal, and it's this idea with which I began our conversation. Is the combination of these apparently binary modes the secret to his work's success? Well, I think they're arguably one in the same. A refusal is a kind of invitation, and an invitation is a kind of refusal. And to be clear about that, let's start with an invitation. So an invitation is a kind of a construct, of course, asking for a a kind of attention on a certain set of ideas. The parameters are set. So in that way, it's a kind of a refusal. It's a refusal of everything else. And a, a refusal is an invitation in the sense that it is directing your attention in a certain kind of way. If you sort of rebuffed or pushed away from something or told to look elsewhere, it also drives your attention in a very specific and particular way. So the interesting thing is that they're very much so one in the same. But I also wonder if, in a way, those two words also invite a kind of commitment to complexity. And it seems to me that that's a real driving factor in the work, a refusal also to make a work that's incredibly simple. It's it's always so rich. It invites all sorts of associations and connections. And that might come from somebody who's seen your work on multiple occasions or seen your work for the first time. It seems to me it's it's rich and the kind of associations that you draw prompt all manner of other associations to a degree. That's a very apt approach or read of the conceptual and theoretical thrust behind the work that I make in the sense that I'm very much so invested and interested in the notion of the complex real as written about by someone like Joan Retallick, the poet and John Cage, historian, thinker, writer, essayist, (laughs) all, all of the above. And this notion of embracing the complexity of an idea of a position Uh, of intention even. And, you know, I am thinking about back to something that someone wrote about the paintings I recently had on view at the Whitney for the biennial. And it was something along the lines of, to paraphrase quite generously, that there was no soft landing. There was no particular focal point you know, no sort of, this is the point of the painting. This is the the main gesture or the sweeping act. This is why you're looking at this painting. And that is true. I'm interested in a kind of all overness, which is a kind of complexity where there's not one thing, one idea, one moment to focus on, but rather it's trying to distill many minor moments that come together to articulate, to give visual life to a major moment. So in a way, this is what a painting is for me. It's a visually major moment. Can you say something about the way you kind of embed that complexity in your process to a degree? Because one of the things about them, it seems to me, is that there's a sort of immediacy, but then as you approach and as you look further, the complexity kind of unravels. Can you say something about that? Well, you know, th- that is the exact experience that I have when I'm looking at the paintings myself. There's almost so much visual information, gestures, marks, strokes, sprays, diversions, that you you almost have to break it down into smaller parts. So you have the totality of it, the sort of complete frame of the work, which hopefully is in some way generatively overwhelming when you encounter the work. 
But then you realize that it's, again, not pointing towards one thing, but if you scan the, the surface of the work, if you scan the visual space of the work, you realize that there are all of these incredibly dense and detailed moments and movements. It's almost like an, a visual orchestra, if you will. And all of these notes are kind of coalescing and, and, and coming together. And in the same way that things come together, they also come apart. So that is very much so what fascinates me is this tension between what is complete and what is incomplete and how one articulates or gives life to and influences the other, as in the idea of completeness versus incomplete. So you said earlier binaries, but I think they're actually sort of these, I'm interested in these kind of dualities and sort of this kind of dissonance as an expression or articulation of harmony. And I think that's conceptually, but also visually. In Who is Queen, the piece at MoMA, you brought together lots of media. And it seems to me that one of the most interesting aspects of that is that you have said that you prefer to talk about modes rather than mm. media. And that connects to what you were just saying. You just used the term dissonance and harmony and modes rather than media. It seems to me there's a lot of musical expression. We'll talk about music in the course of mm. our conversation. But it, I find that really interesting that for you, it's not the very fact of the medium that, that might be important, but what they do to a certain extent. Absolutely. So, I, you know, whenever I get a, a text back, let's say a press release or an essay and it says multimedia, I, I cringe and I say, oh, what a what a <laughs> what a terrible word or what a, a, a terrible operating principle or idea, because it's rather modes and mechanisms that interest me. And I often say that I'm a painter who is preoccupied with how ideas exist in the world. So for me, all of these things are some kind of collage-ist or collage-like manifestation of visual ideas. And that is what, if I had to supply a simple definition of what a painter is, it's someone who's interested in visual ideas, in visual technologies, and how they can be mobilized, historicized, utilized. Absolutely. And can you say something about the sort of distancing that happens when you take a high res photograph of a painted surface mm. as opposed to just that very painted surface in front of you? What happens in that moment, if you like, that slippage? So it's interesting because photography is a very big part of my painting process in the sense that these, quote, originals that I paint are then photographed, then these photographs are processed to inform the various layers of the paintings that are screen printed. And so this process of translation is important to me, that something that exists in the world as one thing is then captured, which is a kind of, you're kind of diluting something in some way and then bringing it into one space and then setting up a different set of demands or circumstances for how it will exist. And then you're taking it out of this space as in the digital space. And then it's going back into the physical space when it's screen printed. So what is lost and what is gained along these steps? So that certainly fascinates me. So the hand, the mark, the gesture that I make with my hand is then brought into a photographic space, is then brought into a digital space, and then brought back into the physical? Or is the physical an articulation or an expression of the real? So that kind of confusion that fascinates me, but it's also the, the process is kind of clear, but then what happens along the way, what happens in each of these steps is a kind of aesthetic, theoretical and conceptual confusion. And I think that's what often makes anything worth looking at or engaging with is on the one hand, this very basic question of how was this thing made? 
And then also why. And the why is maybe where we dwell the longest if we think about it from a historical standpoint. Why was this made? Why did Pollock decide to drip paint <laughs> across the surface of the canvas? Why did Warhol choose to pee on the canvas? You know, why, 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 why did Joan Mitchell choose to hurl, <laughs> you know, the paint? Why did Sam Gilliam choose to drape it, right? Why? That's sort of the the richness. That's That's the legacy. That's the possibility. And then I'm really interested also in this, you've connected Black Dada, this this term to time when you've talked about it as a way to talk about the future while talking about the past. But it also seems to me that time is embedded in that process that you've just described. Painting becomes a time-based medium in that sense. That's right. And I'm really interested in that tension, how subject or theoretical construct and physical making connect. And it seems to me the two are very much embedded within each other. I think they are very much so. I mean, I do think that painting is a temporal technology. It's something that can slow down and speed up time. But it's interesting to kind of be at the vantage point of creating something and trying to create something that is worthy of being looked at, of driving and commanding attention, not for a year or 10 years or 30 years, but maybe 50 years or 100 years or, or more. What is it about the connection to this kind of framed space that is a kind of document, if you will, a document of these different performative acts and gestures that fascinates, that facilitates a kind of temporal reality that is other or outside of that which is ordinary. What makes it extraordinary? And are you asking yourself in the studio all the time that why question that you just talked about when you're, you know, the why of making things the way you make them or the also the why in your references? You know, why am I going to use that text or that piece of music or that film as a reference, etc.? You know, I'm always, when I'm moving through the world, looking for these different kinds of visual impressions and visual notes that fascinate me that I will sometimes draft into the space of the painting and to the space of what I'm working on. And it can be, you know, the graffiti on a building or a scratch on the sidewalk or the way the shadow is cast on a building or across someone's face even and kind of taking these these notes of these visual impressions, these visual moments, and wondering how they can be useful, recreated or recast in the space of the painting. And so it, it's, it's this kind of very rich and mercurial space, but I'm also always trying to drive towards freedom, the freedom of abstraction, the freedom to use these different technologies that I use when I am painting. And by that, I actually mean very simple things because they're all of these sort of strange occurrences and reactions that happen depending on how thick the paint is or what spray paint you're using or, you know, what cap you're using on the spray can. And so for me, I, I really like that word technologies. And it's, it's something that Amy Silman raised when we were having a conversation about uh, painting and it was really liberating when she said that to think about all of these different kinds of modes and mechanisms, way to operate, ways to sort of approach, regress, progress <laughs> uh, as, <laughs> as these kind of uh, technologies. It's, it's so rich and slippery. I really love it. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? There were multiple, I think, you know, from Solowit to Bob Thompson, 
to Joan Mitchell. Nice selection. <laughs> but then there was also, I saw these pair of amazing shows at the Whitney, Solowitz Retrospective, and then also, I can't remember if it was a Barbara Kruger Retrospective or just a series of installations, but uh, those, both of those shows really left an impression on me. And how old were you when the LeWitt Retrospective happened? I mean, you were in your teens, right? Oh, I was a teenager, yeah, sure. I started looking seriously at art and coming to New York to do just that, to look seriously at art when I was a, a teenager. But it, what's shocking is, is how clear some of these exhibitions remain in my mind's eye, mm. or the Douglas Gordon play Dead Real Time and Franz West pair of shows at Gagosian on 24th Street. Like, I really remember that. Or the first Richard Serra show I saw. You know, I have very sort of clear, emotional, visceral response to those memories and those encounters. It's clear from reading about your biography that, that you had a, an, an immediate sense of wanting to be an artist. Even at a very young age, it seems you wanted to be an artist and you were in, you know, you were in Italy as a, a teenager studying art. And it seems to me that an extraordinary early stage to have that sort of that complete commitment yes i now that i'm no longer a teenager no longer have a the malleable mind <laughs> maybe or undeveloped mind of a teenager i realize yes it was quite extraordinary to have that level of commitment but now i'm so lost in that commitment that i can't really imagine anything else I can imagine. Uh, let's talk about LeWitt then, because it, you mentioned him there. He's obviously right at the heart of the whole Black Dada project. Can you say in what way and why? Well, I think it's really that the idea is primary and also that the idea is something that can be transposed or offered to others. So Black Dada is an idea. And I think that was what was so liberating about Lewitt's work, but perhaps more or equally as important, but I mean, his writing, which of course is his work, was so impactful. And it was also that he he did write these kind of short manifesto-ish statements I thought was important because I think that became a kind of guiding principle or operating principle for me that there was this, a, a kind of a text or a, as a, a, operating as a kind of a blueprint for the ideas and how they manifest visually in the world. And it, particularly it was the incomplete open cubes that you refer to in the Black Dada paintings. What was it about that work that you responded to? Mm, I, th I think I touched on that earlier in the sense that that tension or duality between something that is complete announcing itself as incomplete, you know, because in a way it's like, well, this is a arguably a complete work of art, but it's also telling me it's incomplete. There's a, you know, there's a kind of uh, flexibility or looseness that I find pertinent and, and useful and poetically viable. Which historical artist do you turn to the most today? I mean, the first person who comes to me is Du Buffet. Hmm. I'm sort of obsessed with his lines and the freedom in his lines and his willingness to utilize them in so many different ways to make or suggest sculpture in the sense that I think his sculptures are, are they sculpture or do they suggest sculpture? Is I think is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, but I feel like his work is this, he's an excellent amateur. It always seems as though he's practicing, you know, this sort of trite phrase, practice makes perfect, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he sometimes kept the rawness, didn't he? Just He, he was able yeah. to, to maintain a level of rawness that you expect in perhaps a younger artist's work, but he never mm. let go of it. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Is there a particular body of his work that you like more than others or that you refer to more than others? I think I'm particularly just drawn to the scope of his drawings, uh, I think, which was more his, his most experimental and aggressively expressive space, 
so I, I've spent a lot of time looking at his drawings and am lucky enough to, to live with an example of one of his drawings. Oh, how nice. Yeah, I think they're, they're very, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they are. Uh, I'd like to ask you about a particular historical reference in your work, which I find really compelling, which is these Liberian Dan masks. Mm. And, you know, it's such an extraordinarily powerful image. And I, I was wondering why the Dan masks more than any other particular kind of reference. You know, I'm just generally interested in mass because they conceal and but in particularly like with the Dan mass, they're used to evoke. So something else is supposed to come to the surface when when you are mass, when you are kind of concealed, when you are unseen. I, I, I do like this notion of becoming imperceptible in order to become perceptible. Which contemporary artists do you most admire? So many. <laughs> I mean, some who are older than me, someone like Joan Jonas or Stanley Whitney, uh, and then people closer in age like Julie Meritu, and then someone outside of the visual arts like Ishmael Houston Jones hmm. or Ralph Lemon someone a little bit closer in age like the writer Simone White mm -hmm. theorists like Jack Halberstam we'll so, come on to those literary figures and writers in a bit but I wanted to ask you about some visual artists first yeah I, mean, sure. I was sort of expecting Joan Jonas because I know that you had a joint exhibition at one point in 2014 and, mm -hmm. but also there's mm -hmm. a there's a wonderful it seems to me affinity between the work in the sense that with Joan again that idea of mode and medium seems to me to be very absolutely right for Joan as well so she's completely naturally moving between video performance drawing etc and that seems like a lovely affinity between yours and her work I think so but there's also this notion of drafting something and revising something and that's very much so how I paint the paintings are these drafts and revisions and just to throw in a, yet another literary reference uh, would be Rachel Blau du Plessis, who her books are drafts one through 20, drafts 20 through four, you know, so everything is a draft. So I love this idea, uh, but that's very much so what painting is for me and our drafts and revisions. And that's one of the things that just conceptually or even maybe pragmatically that I've always appreciated about Joan's work is that when she goes back to an earlier work or even when she's working on a work, it seems like something that is open to being revised, revisited, reconfigured. I wanted to ask also about Jill Friedman. I know whose mm. pho photographs of Resurrection City figured in your Who is Queen work at MoMA. Tell me about those works. Why were they important? It was, it, was it a sort of part of your historical research for that show or had you already had them in the back of your mind as something you wanted to refer to anyway? It was very much so a part of the historical research for that show that they came to the fore. And I just felt like they captured the different subjects as in the people who were occupying Resurrection City and then Resurrection City itself as a subject with a particular kind of sensitivity and vulnerability that I think is very rare in photography. So there was a lot of heat. Those images have a lot of heat and were very informative in terms of how to capture and create and how to use architecture as a means to capture and create a historical moment or encounter or structure. And that is why they were those images and having this view on to something that I couldn't be physically present to observe and be involved in and rub up against or exist alongside. They were so useful. In a way, the structure that helped to articulate who is queen in many ways had already been developed with uh, Fred Tang, the architect. But those images of Joel Friedman's photography did fill me in on the particulars of 
the kind of emotive or emotional structure that I want it to attend to who is queen as a work, as exhibition, as form. And in terms of that sort of history of protest in relation to ongoing protest as depicted in your work over many years, for instance, I mean, I'm conscious that in 2015 you had a show in London in which there were works which had Black Lives Matter written on them. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of protest and capturing it through work. Tell me about, about that ongoing element of your work. What role does it play in terms of your communication with the audience? You know, I recently posited this idea that what if all visual art was protest? In a way, I think one of the reasons, if we go back to this question of why a painting exists, is to suggest or give life to some kind of alternative, some notion or feeling of otherness. So for me, abstraction is not to replicate the known, but rather to give opportunity for the unknown, for the unimagined, the unrealized. And of that is, is a kind of protest. And that's, and that's a crucial thing, isn't it? Because, you know, the Greenbergian conception of abstraction was it was somehow contentless. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> but your contention of abstraction is that it's almost maximum content, that it is a form of protest, you know, that it does have a political role. It is a political act. Yes, in the sense that it's not necessarily articulating the set of policy positions or saying, you know, yes or no, right or wrong, but any kind of alternative is a political act. Any idea that exists in the world is a political act. I mean, you, maybe you could have soft politics and hard politics, right? Maybe there's a spectrum or some sort of gradient or scale, but I would posit that yes. So I don't agree, of course, with this Greenbergian notion of contentless. I don't think that anything is, is contentless. Everything is, is marked or is marking. What do you have pinned to your studio wall? Well, I have the studies and what is referred to within the space of the studio as originals pinned to the wall. So the different works that I am working on and painting and revising, they're all pinned to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have other artists work as well, sort of corresponding with them? Or do you keep them away, as it were? I keep them away, yeah. <laughs> And that's a conscious decision to just not allow them to seep into the work too much or to not have those too directly in your mind as you work? Absolutely. I mean, I do have certain books on my desk, which is, I guess, in a way, a kind of pinning to the wall. So I have a, a Du Buffet book of drawings of the show that I think was at the Morgan Library a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I have a Issey Miyake book on my desk and so these kinds of things are more or less pinned to the wall. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. The free app offers access to more than 85 cultural organisations through a single download. New interactive guides are being added regularly. Among the latest is for Greenwood Rising, the Black Wall Street History Centre in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It focuses on the Greenwood District, the site of a racially motivated massacre in 1921. And its director, Phil Armstrong, says it catalyses important dialogue around racial reconciliation and restorative justice. Adam Pendleton's work Work has been shown at several of the leading institutions featured on the app, including the Studio Museum in Harlem in New York. If you download Bloomberg Connects, you can explore the Studio Museum's new $175 million building, watch a time-lapse film of the 82,000 square foot space under construction, and read an interview with the architect David Adjay. You can also find out about the museum's ongoing programme, which features, among others, a major sculpture by a former guest on a brush with, Thomas J. Price. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? I think it, it depends on 
the circumstances, but I was, of course, when Who Is Queen was up, going to MoMA quite a bit. So if there was a, if I was keeping a tally, <laughs> it would be somewhere between <laughs> MoMA or the the Whitney. But I think Mo- MoMA would still be in the lead because when Who Is Queen was up, Who Is Queen kept evolving and changing, and so I was always going there when I could to observe how it had or was evolving and changing. Is that a fascinating process, scary process, whatever, for an artist, you know, engaging with people looking at your work, if you like. So you're going into the atrium, that vast space, and you're seeing people interacting with the work. I know some artists like to engage the public, literally say, you know, how are you experiencing it? But how, how closely do you want that process to not want to come between your work and its audience, but to, to sort of oh, be, be a mediator? Well, I mean, I was certainly never announcing myself. <laughs> you know, I didn't have a, a T-shirt on that said, I am the artist. You know, I just sort of, I want it to uh, disappear. But I did, I was fascinated about what was driving people's attention and, there was kind of this leveling, which I found fascinating that there, you know, there were the moving image works and the paintings and the drawings and then the sound and the structure itself. And I was very taken by how people seem to engage with all of the different modes and mechanisms in the same, the same kind of time and attention uh, was given to all of them but it was also this sense of everything all at once. You see it, you hear it, <laughs> you move around it. And and so, you know, sometimes I I don't think much about like if for maybe for a gallery show, depending on the show, it's sort of like, oh, it's up. And But I was, I was very fascinated about how people were kind of viewing and interacting with the work. Then I guess it becomes this question of value or was it important to me or unimportant to me? Did I care? Did I not care? I'm not ready to speak to that, but I was certainly fascinated by it. I think one of the things about that is that obviously as an artist, you may labor for many months or years on a project. And then when it's in the world, you may Mm. not have direct experience of it, especially if let's say you've installed a show, you've been there for the opening and it's overseas and then you travel back to where you live. It's, it's, it's a curious balance, the public role of the artist, if you like. Well, it's interesting. And I think, you know, this is why, you know, you don't make one painting, you know, you dedicate a life to it because in some way you are interested or I am interested in sort of calibrating or being in dialogue with these, the audience or audiences, plural. There's more than one kind of audience and more than one audience. And that's also kind of happened with Who is Queen is now I'm very much so interested in staging this work, this exhibition as form in different ways and different places because it is a kind of something that needs to be drafted and revised in the same way that the the process of painting operates or functions. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? I hope this is an answer to your question, but the cultural experience of traveling, of physically going to different spaces and absorbing different kinds of energies and temporal realities and moving in and out of different kinds of spaces, both alone, but then also absorbing the people, the food, the smells, the textures, the colors of different places. Uh, Travel is, I can't overstate its importance to me. And there are different kinds of travel. You know, if you can't get on the airplane or get in the car, opening a book is a kind of journey. And so sometimes when I'm looking for inspiration, so to speak, and I I don't really like that word, but if I need sort of a jolt, I'll go to a bookstore, you know, and I'll look for something unusual or unused as in haven't seen that before haven't thought about that before but i think the ability to organize thought the ability to organize images the ability to organize 
language is one of the most important things that we do as humans as a kind of manifestation of our humanity and the ways in which we do and can connect to each other. I wanted to ask you about Pietra Santa, the visit to Italy when you were in your teens. How much of an effect did that have on you? Did that almost set that blueprint of travel being quintessential to your work? I think it did. And I think it, it happened at a at that time in my life. So going to study art in Italy was like my first trip outside of the United States. And then it wasn't just a trip. It was living there, you know, <laughs> so it was sort of it was so extreme that I don't think I really realize what was happening. But, if, you know, of course, so it's Italy. So, of course, one of the first things you notice is, wow, this food is really different and really good. you right. <laughs> <laughs> different yeah. level of pizza. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then just this sense of history, the history of art. Everything seems so old, you, you know, but in a really affecting way, you know? I, I, I think it really started to articulate a kind of ethical dimension uh, to making art, maybe from a philosophical standpoint, but also from a practical standpoint that to make something and ask someone to engage with it deeply for a sustained period of time, there's a kind of ethical dimension to it, you know? Like, why, like, you know, to be worthy, to make something that is worthy, to be worthy. To, so I think that to be an artist, there's something about being worthy. Your work is worthy of attention, worthy of, of time, without putting too much pressure on it at the same time. Let's talk about literature. Which writers or poets do you return to the most? So I return to people like... Joan Ritalik a lot. It's sort of like everybody and nothing or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with Joan Ritalik because, it, because again, that's a, a, she's a writer that you've connected with. You did this project called The Symposium, mm -hmm. uh, which sounds great. Um, but also it seems like, a, a you know, a, a, I've read a few of her works and it's these extraordinary fragmentary and and amazing collisions of information and and images and it seems again so apt in terms of your mm -hmm. work. it's also this notion of setting up a kind of series of operations a, a kind of uh, rules or structure to kind of guide process and and then seeing what happens so the a kind of this drive towards chance or the chance encounter or occurrence fascinates me. And that that's something that I think happens visually in my work, in the paintings. And so to then see that kind of transposed or brought into the space, into a literary space, I, I kind of like how they're kind of analogous gestures, but with different materials at work, at play, but the kind of there's a slippage or some similarities in, in, in thinking and approach, but also real differences in how they, they manifest and exist in the world. There's a film was, that's part of Who's Queen, which is with Jack Halberstam, who you mentioned earlier on. Correct. What was it about Jack's writing and not just the writing, but just the, the person, I guess, as well, that made you want to make that film? Well, I think Jack's book, I think his book, The Wild, is very important. It's a kind of way of articulating an ethics or a sort of contemporary set of values around abstraction, I would argue. And I don't know what Jack would say about that to back to me, <laughs> but this sense of being committed to the experiment of being is a vital importance that we never become fixed or stable, but it's always that life should always be about operating on shaky ground, you know? And so if I think about the canvas, sort of the blank canvas as shaky ground, unstable, <laughs> Um, destabilizing, to be destable, to be destabilizing, 
being the kind of impetus or thrust behind the work or the ideas that we put out into the world. How much is it also about an idea of queer identity and how much is it important to you? You said also about Who's Queen, about that one of the origins for that title is from a kind of slur that was said to you. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I wonder Mm -hmm. to what extent is Jack helpful in exploring that particular topic or that particular theme? Absolutely, in the sense of the, what it's its utility and uh, what can it do now in a contemporary sense and also in a historical sense to queer something. Is it still radical? How can it remain or be radical? But I try not to get so lost or stuck or even talk too much about these identities. I want to move beyond identities Uh, Not to say I want to be unmarked, but I argue and want to exist within and through a kind of abstraction. Maybe I can even qualify that a little bit in a kind of representational abstraction. Um, I want to ask about the revival, your performance that you made for Performer, the performance biannual in in the U.S., and it seems to me that was an extraordinary moment for you, a, a transformative moment perhaps for your mm. career in, in 2007. In it, there are a series of literary quotes as well as quotes from political speeches and things like that. And I wondered that sort of collage approach, but through performance, mm. um, <laughs> that seems to me a really interesting idea. And that sort of seems to have transmitted a lot through the work and continues to. Oh, absolutely, Ben. I'm a collagist through and through. <laughs> it's kind of put it all together, mix it up, create a kind of visual sense of these different blocks, pieces, fragments. It's very rewarding process for me. And yeah, you know, with the revival, I realized after the revival, so yes, that was 2007. And then 2008, I articulated Black Data and I wanted to, to create visual work, static work, drawings, paintings, what have you, that had the kind of intensity of that which is live, so a kind of liveness. And I think that's really come to the fore in the newest paintings I've been working on, the which I refer to as the days painting, really because they take so long to make, so days, <laughs> <laughs> about that kind of scattered or shattered sense of attention, right? Of sort of being pushed in all these different directions and quickly, you know, there's a kind of speed, I would say, to these paintings that fascinates me that I think is connected to that which is is live. And then the Black Dada paintings, which are these sort of more still and monochromatic paintings, I argue are the stage sort of the structure for the work, the stage for the work, foundational to the work. And then all of these other paintings are, I would say, much more in a, in a way more performative visually, kind of static almost. And obviously the term Black Dada is, is in part a quote from Amiri Baraka's poem. Correct. Which is called Black Dada and Neolismus. So one thing I'm really interested in is how central is that poem to the origin of the work or was it just a springboard to a certain extent? It was a springboard but Amiri Baraka as a cultural figure, as a writer, as a as a cultural critic, as a theorist, his writing, his ideas are something that I keep turning towards he was also just an amazing performer. I mean, he was like, a, he was virtuosic. I mean, the way he could read his writing, is, it was really like Aretha Franklin or something, you know, when he would read, oh my God, you know, <laughs> sort of, it was kind of uncanny. It was like John Coltrane, but uh, and he was he was linked to a jazz quartet as well, wasn't he? I mean, that, that's the, that's the thing is that you know that there was a jazz setting he, for what he, he did. He was, and I, yes, and I, I don't raise Coltrane to say it was like jazz or it was jazz, but it was just that is really just to articulate its impact, its performative value was extraordinary.
what music or other audio do you listen to while you're working? Well, it depends. When I'm trying to get into the groove, you know, when I'm trying to get working, I listen to music. And lately, I've been listening to, I was listening to this album, Nina Simone with Strings, uh, which has been kind of really nice. You know, I, what I really love about her voice is the range and the lack of range. You know, she, it wasn't, she wasn't like someone who had like, you know, all these low notes or in all these mid range and all these high notes. It was sort of all like compact in the middle there. And the things that she would have to do to make that interesting, that mid range just fascinates me <laughs> from talking to singing to how slow the, the I mean, the phrasing is just in, impeccable that she made that work sort of like Bob Dylan, like, you made that voice work, <laughs> that voice, you know? It's the emotional range, isn't it, in Simone? It's just yeah. incredible. As you say, within a relatively yeah. small register, there's just an, there's yeah. every motion under the sun. It's, it's yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, can yeah, I ask you, it's, it's a good moment cool. to, to, to ask you about this wonderful thing that you did with Ellen Gallagher and Judy Meritu, who you mentioned earlier on, and, and Rashi Johnson, I think, where you basically preserved her home in North Carolina as a, as a space that should be reserved as a sort of cultural space. Can you say more about that? Uh, well, it's an ongoing project. And yes, with Rashi, Julie and Ellen, the four of us protecting and preserving her childhood home, which well, was actually where she was literally born. She was born at this site. And it's really, and so if I think about it as a kind of sculpture, the site as a kind of, so if I think about it like more conceptually, it, it's really, you know, how site is then connected to a different a set of ideas, or in this case, music. And if it exists, if it's, quote, protected, protected in the sense that it remains a part of the cultural idea. And I guess in, in, in this particular instance, the culture idea of what is American, then it has the opportunity to influence dialogue and conversations, artists, musicians, composers for many, many years to come. And that's critical. That's obviously of tremendous importance. I want to ask you about Julius Eastman, an extraordinary figure who made a remarkable body of work, but was largely forgotten until pretty recently. So what's so important to you about Julius Eastman? Because he's, he's directly inspired, you know, the titles of his works have inspired bodies of work by you. Mm, they sure have. Yeah. So like so many things like the, the Lewitt, Incomplete Cubes, uh, Eastman's titles, Crazy Nigger, you know, <laughs> Evil Nigger. <laughs> Those are what I saw that language sort of hurled existing in the world. And then I heard the music and you kind of are trying to make these impossible connections to the music in, in, in the language. I love that kind of confusion, you know. And I mean, he was an incredible composer and... It just, again, the, the mere fact that someone like him existed and to make gestures, and that can be sort of appropriating or borrowing his language, his titular language, to drive attention towards him and ideas, that, uh, that's something that I always will do and do do. Also, is it that balance between discord and lyricism or harmony in his work that appeal there are moments of extraordinary beauty in those pieces mm. and it seems to me that that's a that's always so interesting again as you say with those titles it's it seems jarring but it's so powerful you know i'm really interested in moments of fleeting quote beauty mm -hmm. or fleeting sort of harmony right so like most of the in, this is not necessarily a description of Julius Eastman's work, but like, let's say that most of something is jarring or off-putting, in which is just to say it's unusual, you know? But then there's these sort of lovely moments, you know? And, and it's so hard to explain because it's not that some things are lovely and other things are jarring and off-putting, right? There's a, there's a lot of 
gray or there's a lot of space. There should be a lot of space around these ideas of what is jarring and what is our pudding, what is beautiful and what is ugly. But do you kind of know what I mean, you know, when you're kind of listening to something, but then there's like just this fleeting moment, you know, and you're just like, oh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of like it's hard to articulate, you know, you, it's kind of like, you know, when you're trying to explain something to someone and you just give up and you say, God, you, you just had to be there. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I kind of want to create things, moments, situations, paintings where maybe you're trying to describe it, but ultimately you say, you know what? You, you just got to see it. You know, you, you just you just have to be Absolutely. there. That's great. And I really urge people who are listening to this to listen to, to Julius's work because it's, it is remarkable and exactly as Adam describes. What other media influence your work? Well, it was so funny because Issey Miyake came to the fore for me you know, I've of course been aware of his work for years and years and years and years. And then just three weeks ago, I became re-obsessed. And actually the day he passed away, I, everything I was wearing was Issey Miyake, save for my t-shirt. Even my socks were. <laughs> and it's interesting because, you know, it's it's like, if you go to his website, it's like Issey Miyake Inc. And it's like, it's a company, right? But his ideas, he was so clearly an artist. He was so clearly an architect. And yes, he was clearly what we know him to be, a fashion designer. But my goodness, do his ideas, they don't age. They're so timeless and so contemporary and fluid. But again, this idea of his technology, his clothes are literally technology embedded with and sort of made with these technologies that he developed, invented, executed, revised, and you know, utilized. It's, it's, it's an incredible body of work, and it's, it's been very generative to return to it and, and, and look at it and wear it and spend time with it. That's lovely. Um, I wanted to ask about dance. Um, I've seen the film with Yvonne Rayner, and uh, that is a, a really touching film, I thought, it was two people from different fields connected fields of course meeting together was it your behest you brought with you effectively a script and she brought with her some movements and it seems so entirely natural that it seems almost like you'd only barely agreed on what you do and it's just unfolding like that was it much more structured before it happened or is it as it appears just so natural and flowing and yeah. it's as it appears Yes, it's as it appears. The only structure was that there was a camera. We met at a certain time at a certain place. And I asked her to read something, but everything that occurs was totally, it actually occurred. It's a document of an encounter, for sure. It could have been anything. But you met in a diner, and I was interested that she regarded that diner as a kind of studio. And it struck me that it, what was very interesting about that was that it was making a point about the spaces where art happens to a degree. Absolutely, yeah. Because I wanted to, to meet her somewhere where she makes her art. or And she said, well, this diner, you know, <laughs> this sort of nondescript diner, which I actually think is no longer open um, yeah. but art happens anywhere and everywhere all of the time. It happens in a hello or a goodbye. It's uh, everything and everywhere all at once. And while we're talking about studios, is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? Yes, going to the studios on Sunday. So every Sunday I... If I'm in, in New York, I come to the studio to paint. And that is really important. <laughs> <laughs> it's my most, quote, productive day, if you will, because it's a quiet day. There are so few distractions, you know, and I get to do what I love most. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? Okay, only one, then I would have to say Autumn Rhythm, number 30, the 1950 abstract, quote, abstract expressionist painting, Jackson Pollock, which is in the Mets collection. So when I was very young, when I was a teenager, I 
stood in front of that painting. I, I don't know what I knew about him, but I don't think I knew a lot. And when I saw that painting, I was moved to tears. It's almost like the purest of them all, isn't it? I mean, I, I, that's the way I always think about that painting. It's like pure Pollock. <laughs> it's, it's pure something, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, what is art for? So there's this uh, quote, and I want to get it right. And I don't know if it says what art is, but it's something that the poet Jane Kenyon wrote to her husband. They're, they're both deceased. Her husband's Donald Hall. And it's actually, so what is art to me? So a, a question, and this particular quote poses this question. And it's along the lines of, I believe in the miracles of art, but what prodigy will keep you safe? beside me. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Ben. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. I appreciate it. Adam Pendleton in Abstraction is at Pace Gallery in Geneva from the 7th of September until the 5th of October. Adam Pendleton Toy Soldier is at Galleria Eva Presnuba in Zurich from the 10th of September until the 26th of November. Adam is in the Whitney Biennial, Quiet as it's Kept, which is at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York until the 5th of September. And a solo exhibition of his work runs at Mumok in Vienna next year from the 31st of March to the 10th of September. And that's it for this episode and indeed this series. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our other podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues, which is back in September. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the art newspaper podcasts are Amy Dawson and Henrietta Bentel. Thanks all also to Daniela Hathaway and a big thank you to Adam Pendleton. We're back with another series in mid-September. Bye for now. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.